No words. I'm gonna come back. Look, I'm. I'm Do your thing, Marquita. I'm here. All right. It says it's being live streamed, so that's excellent. I'm gonna pull up Facebook just so we can keep a watch on it. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Hallelujah. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. Good evening. Good evening. Is sound all right? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right. We are going to thank God for this afternoon. Listen, this is like thank you, Jesus. Every week that we have att attempted to do this live and have a conversation surrounding the importance of connection, we have suffered technical issues. And so that just leads me to believe that there is something so very important about us being connected in the kingdom. That is definitely something in this season that the enemy is not wanting to go for. And so I um, am excited for what's going to happen on tonight because I believe that it's going to be something very powerful um, that's supposed yeah. to be edified. Before we get started, we're going to start off with prayer. Um, and so, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you right now. We thank you. We thank, thank you. We thank you, you for this opportunity to join in and share in your word, dear God. We ask that you come in and allow us to decrease as you increase, Father God. Allow yes, your God. spirit to resonate in this topic, in this discussion, Father God, where that souls be edified, okay. Father God. God. That every seed that is sown on tonight, that it will go back and that it will uh, produce a fruit, a fruit tenfold, uh, twentyfold, a hundredfold, dear God. Allow it to um, just uh, produce a bounty, Father yeah. God. We just ask that you Govern our minds, Father God. Let our thoughts be in alignment with you on tonight and allow our tongues to be in alignment as well, Father God, so that everything that is spoken is spoken in truth and that we walk it out, Father God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. So, good afternoon, Josh. Hey, what's up, Marquita? We are streaming live. We have to do. What's going on? We had to do something a little different today um, because we have encountered technical difficulties for what? It's been what, about a month now? Yeah, about a month. Yeah, been every Wednesday. That, uh... yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, it's a delay, so I wanna make sure I'm not cutting you off. No, no, but no. Um, every week we've encountered this warfare, so um, again, I'm so certain that there is something that we need out of this topic of connection. We know that, um, you know, divided we fall. And so I believe that in this season, the enemy is trying to keep us from uniting in the body of Christ. You know, the word tells us to pr protect the unity. And so while we are working, actively pursuing this, the enemy is trying to fight us. So uh, forgive me because I was telling Josh before we got started, my computer decided to shut down um, and just start updating itself without me prompting it or anything. So I'm already started because I had to go up into warfare mode to make sure we were set. But um, tonight we are talking about connection and friendship. Um, I know Josh, on last week, you focused on um, connections. We're, we're going through the, the ministry of Paul and you talked about pieces, which was so good. And also just the connection. Um, aspect. Um, if you want, you want to take a moment to just kind of update everybody, like kind of brief everybody on what last week's topic was about. I know you started on um, um, Paul when he was knocked off of the, um, knocked to the ground and almost like yes. his conversion. Yes. Uh, so last week, uh, the week, week before last, we talked about connection to purpose, connection uh, uh, to, to the right people, to friends, and then uh, connection for closure. Uh, and then the Lord led me uh, to speak about pieces. 
uh, and I spoke about the broken pieces. I spoke about the lost pieces. And then I spoke about the all-encompassing peace of God that surpasses all understanding, which is crucial in times of warfare, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's basically what I did. And towards the end of last, um, last week's Bible study, uh, I felt the weight, sis, of, of some people that were on here and I also felt attacked myself. And I said, oh, no, 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 it's time to go in now. You know, I really don't have time for the devil, you know, to give him uh, rain, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense. So, so when it went into some, some warfare last week. And so it's really been good. You're 100% right. The devil doesn't want this kind of thing to come out on a panel speaking clearly around the word. So, yeah, so those pieces... I hope that we can pick back up on connection tonight and friendship. I really like that. I'm glad we're revisiting it. Yes. So, of course, we're doing, we're going, we're, we have a focus on Paul's ministry. And so, of course, we can't discuss connection and friendship without talking about him and Bartimaeus. I mean, Bartimaeus, um, Barnabas. And so, um, I will definitely want to pick up there. Um, I'm going to start in Acts 9 and 26, um, Acts 9, 26 and 28. Um, that's where I want to start off. The one thing that I did want to say, as I was reading through this, I thought it was so beautiful in um, Acts 9 and 15, where it says, but the Lord said to him, go for this man. He is my chosen instrument um, to take my name to the Gentiles, kings and Israelites. You know, of course, Paul was out there persecuting Christians and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, the fact that God still, even in his mess, was like, no, he's mine. So yep. he sent for him. So I thought <laughs> it was so beautiful. But, um, I, you know, God is just so good. So we're going to start in Acts 9, 26 and 25. It says, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples but they were all afraid of him since they did not believe he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostle and explained to him, uh, explained to them that Saul had seen the Lord on the road and the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. All mm -hmm. right. I read that for the first time. Um, the one thing that stood out to me was the fact that when he went to the disciples or went to join the disciples, they kind of like rejected him in a sense. They, they were like, mm, we don't know. We know your past. We know what you've done. We don't believe that you are a disciple. So mm, I can only imagine in that moment, they're probably looking at him like, no, you know, that thing where they say no new friends. It was almost like, no, no, we're good. Cause we know too much about you. <laughs> that. And that stood out to me because, yeah, you know, it's like how many times we, in our, you know, in our natural lives have probably experienced rejection or um, people not necessarily taking us serious in our walk because, or in our lives, period, just because they know so much about our lives. What's that yeah. saying that says um, familiarity breeds contempt? And so yeah. it reminded me of um, when Jesus went back to his hometown and he's like trying to perform these miracles and all these kind of stuff. And they was like, oh, that's just Mary's boy. Oh, he's just a carpenter. And it's like they couldn't receive those miracles because they were so familiar with who he was. They knew too much about him. And so um, in that moment, I was reading it and I thought about um, how, how he seemed to have been rejected from the disciples. And so, I, you know, I was brought to this question of like, how many times has that happened? to us where it caused us to necessarily kind of like disconnect in a sense because also in in speaking about connections it, it you know i'd be remiss to miss the topic of disconnect so there's things that can happen in our lives that can cause us to be disconnected um in any kind of sense so could you imagine paul encountering god going through this conversion and attempting to move forward in his purpose and then all of a sudden he's kind of like rejected in a sense. And just imagine in today's society, how that could pressure us or make us feel like, well, maybe I'm not supposed to do this. But my question was, have you ever like had an instance in your life where maybe you had been lost or rejected that kind of pushed you away from purpose that kind of kept, or at least delayed it? Oh yeah, uh, most definitely. I think the, biz the biggest disconnect uh, for me, Marquita, in my life, wasn't necessarily from other people. 
it was my perspective. Yeah. My perspective on what I thought people thought of me. I didn't necessarily need the disciples to come and tell me I wasn't worth it. I disconnected myself. Yeah. But here's the funny thing. I would always say things like, well, I wonder why they didn't call me. That's their fault. And I'm like, man, hold up just a second, bro. You got, and then when I was a younger man, I felt like I was justified. Cause you know, I've been to plenty of places and uh, churches, you know, Marquita. And, you know, sometimes you just don't feel like you fit in. And I think I had the fit in syndrome. You know, I wanted to fit in uh, to the group. And what God was trying to get across to me was, it's not about fitting in. It's about being in my will, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, there's seasons at times where God will have you in certain places where you might not feel like you fit the click, you fit the mold, you fit the place, but maybe he's using that area. You know what I'm saying? So like, I would say my biggest enemy or my biggest foe uh, or critic, should I say, uh, would not be the disciples as it was for Saul. It's been my own mindset. It's been my perspective. It's been, you know, the, the warfare that goes on in my mind, sis, you know, because I'll beat myself up before somebody can, you know, and I come back to it and I'm like, man, I look back now that I have a, a few more years and I'm still learning to this day that I keep having to check myself. Yeah. Like I, I'm not, I'm, I, I am welcome here. This is my family. And uh, I remember going to pass one night uh, and I felt like I had just royally screwed up, sis. And I, it's like I kept telling him, kept coming to him, kept being held accountable to him. And he he would tell me sometimes, he son, look at me. And I look at him and he, he said it nice. He didn't like, look at me, son. You know, he's like, son, look at me. He's like, I love you and I'm not going anywhere. And then it tore me up. I'm In my mind, I'm thinking, why not? Why would you not? Why would you not want to leave? You know? And so that's just, that's just me. That's my perspective. So the guys really worked on my perspective is the biggest word, the biggest thing I could say uh, over the past 10, 15 years of my life, for sure. Yeah. And that's good because um, not only is it just like outward rejection, we also can suffer from like self-rejection. And, mm-hmm. but as you were speaking, it made me think about like the orphan spirit where in some instances, because we're so not accustomed to having like that that natural father or that natural guardian or whatever that we allow ourselves to be kind of disconnected in a sense and so when someone does show us love then we don't necessarily know how to receive it and we're like well I messed up why are you still here because that may have been our past I know that's my issue like in your mind you're like well everybody leaves so if I mess up you know what time you checking out you know yeah or, but for me, on the other end, it pushed me to be almost like a perfectionist because it's like, I'm going to guarantee or prove to you that I'm good enough for you to stay. So it's amazing how that can work on both ends, you know. Um, but then as we talk about like the rejection, whether it's self-inflicted or um, outer rejection from an, an outer source, uh, we see in the story of Paul where Barnab- uh, Barnabas comes in and he's like, I could only imagine, and this is me because I have such a wild imagination. I could just imagine him just grabbing him by his hand, like, come with me, bro, I got you. And he, him walking to the group of the gods, and he's like, listen, this man is a man of God. He's done X, Y, and Z. Have y'all not heard about the miracles that he performed? You know, he encountered God, like, on the Damascus Road. Like, he is one of us, you know? And so it's beautiful because even when we have messed up because I'm still thinking about how um, Paul was a persecutor of the Christians even when we mess up when I see him connect to um, Barnabas and the story it is almost like God's hand being on him like how no matter no matter how far off we are God is still he's still concerned about us and you know the scripture says he's perfecting all things that's concerning us And it's like beautiful because even though Paul was messing up, even though, I mean, he was, you talk about royally messing up, he was messing up, Um, but God still had a plan for him. And so the beauty of that is that I think sometimes, you know, the scripture says, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we get into a space where we condemn ourselves and we think that we're not worthy. And the Lord is like, no, I got you. Just get get back up come on in. You're, you're in, you're a part of my, my family. You're a part of me. So come on in, dust yourself off 
and let's see what it's about, you know? So it made me think like, have you ha ever experienced like a Barnabas situation where, you know, you may have been on the outskirts, quote unquote, on the outskirts of God. We always think that we know that we're never too far for God to reach us, but where that you thought that you had messed up so, so royally where, um, you, you just thought you just messed it up, but God sent someone who kind of reeled you back in. I, I mean, me just knowing the little bit that I've known in the few months that I've known you all, I know pastor is probably one of them for sure, but have you oh. ever had like that Barnabas, um, encounter? Oh, most definitely. Um, the most vivid one that I can remember, uh, I was in Orlando and I was, I was living with a young lady that was not my wife. Um, the Lord was already convicted me. I mean, I would be driving home and he'd be like, look, son, I've already told you like multiple times. And because number one, my performance based acceptance would kick in, like, what are people going to think? And then secondly, the rebellious side of me kicked in because I had benefits with that relationship, you know, and I, have, I mean, we all know we're all grown folk. Most of us, I'm like, <laughs> I have benefits with these relationships and um, you know, to an extent, I felt accepted and I knew I was loved, but it wasn't the right place. And uh, I remember coming home from work one day and I saw this uh, gentleman out in the yard. And uh, I don't know if I walked down or if I said, what's up or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm pretty outgoing. I just said, what's up? And uh, old dude was standing there. He's probably about six, two, six, three, dreaded. And when he spoke, I could tell he was an island dude. He was from uh, Jamaica. And uh, his name was Tamam Bell. Still have him on Facebook. I hope he sees this so he knows how, how he blessed my life. Um, but when I spoke to him, he exuded Marquita with that kind of Barnabas. He had the gift of encouragement. There's yeah. such a difference. Like it exuded from him and his family. And it trickled down to his family. And uh, he started asking me a couple of questions. Just heard about my day, this and that, the other. And he said, listen, Josh, I, I would like for you to go to church with me. And man, he started bringing it up. And man, before I knew it, Marquita, I was in his front yard in midsummer on my knees with my hands raised by this man's praying for me and in the middle of a suburban area at that time where we were staying. And he's sitting there laying hands on me, praying for me out in the middle of the lawn. And so I got up feeling so refreshed. But that night, Here's, here comes the Barnabas moment. This is so great. I went out that night, just so happened, and started drinking and had a night, even though I was just encouraged. And I told myself, man, you know what? I can't get right. You ever see that movie uh, Life with Eddie Murphy? I said, can't get right. That's how I felt. I said, I just can't get right. And so I woke up in the bed, and I was just kind of like, man, I ain't going to. And my phone starts ringing. And it was tomorrow. So I hit the decline. And I was like, Nah, I ain't picking the phone up. And so the phone rang again. He was determined. So I picked the phone. What's going on? He said, Josh, hey, come on down. We have breakfast for you. He said, I don't care what you did last night. It doesn't matter. Come to me. And I said, what? And so that was kind of like when Saul got knocked off his horse. You know, I felt like, man, I know I just persecuted Jesus, but this is the same Jesus that's calling me. And we just run right past that. Paul had to come to grips with the people that just got stoned, like I was talking about. And so in the midst of him being blind in this whole glorious moment, we make it like this big, beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. It was ugly. Mm -hmm. He couldn't see. The people around him were so scared. They let him into the town and left him. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, yeah, that was that was my experience. I found myself at the altar that completely, you know, just, I mean, it wrecked me. Like when I tell you it wrecked me, I went to church with him. Uh, and, and it was just a beautiful thing. I found myself back at the altar on my knees. And that was the reason that I ended up, you know, you know, coming back, uh, to, to good communication with the Lord. I don't want to take up too much time with that story, but yeah, that was my Barnabas. That was one of the most, uh, vivid Barnabas moments I've ever had, Marquita. Yeah. I'll tell you, I had, um, you know, um, I'm a hairstylist and so it's my job to serve and to, to pour into other people. I've functioned in marketplace ministry for, I mean, like 16 years now, before it even had a name, right? And so I was always so used to just pouring and pouring. And um, I'm, I'm, that's my job. So of course people are gonna take, that's just what they, that's, that's what this relationship is. I remember, um, 
I had this customer who came in and I, I, I'm not even going to lie. I hope she sees it because I actually texted her this morning. And I was like, I love you, sis. Um, like I was all in my feelings as I was going, preparing for this tonight. But um, she came in and I remember she kept asking me, um, you know, who's looking out for you? Who, who, who has your back? You know, who pours into you? And I remember feeling so weird. Like, why does she keep asking me this? I couldn't comprehend it at the time because I was not used to people looking out for me. I was just used to providing the service and people taking it and going on by the day. And so she was insistent. Like she came every week um, and she would always ask me, you know, how are you feeling? And I'm thinking, I'm fine. And she's like, no, how are you really feeling? And so I had to get accustomed to my Barnabas because I was not accustomed to having someone check in on me. I was used to uh, encouraging. I'm the encourager, right? And so fast forward, you know, my mother passes away and I go into this dark place. Um, it was dark, Josh, like, and honestly, not even a lot of people knew that I was in a dark space because I was so, I was so, um, I knew how to front, <laughs> I knew how to I knew how to put on a brave face. And I remember during that time, um, after my mother passed, I literally took a little time, like a day or two off to get her services put together, went back to work, did all my customers so I could have more time off for the services. And I remember people telling me, you're just so brave, you're just so strong. And I'm thinking, y'all don't even know, like I am crushed on the inside. And so because I was holding that in, and not dealing with those emotions, I went into this dark space where the enemy started really messing with my mind. Um, I started drinking heavily. Um, mind you, I would go to work, do ministry all day, smile, make sure everybody was taken care of. And then I would come home and I would drink. Then one drink came to two drinks. And then two. Then I had to take sleeping medicine and all these different things. And she would not let me go. While everybody else is patting me on the back, congratulating me like, oh, you're so amazing. She's like, no, sis. She literally was right there holding me up. And she's like, are you good? Are you okay? And she literally walked with me through this season of darkness. But she's like, no, come on. I got you. And we gave each other like this safe space to just be raw and open, right? And so I said all that to say, she now is still my Barnabas because she randomly checks in on me. And she's like, you good? Are you all right? And I said all that to say that even when she initially came, that was years before my mother passed. So that was years before I fell into like this darkness or this, this lost space, but she was already there ready. And the yeah. Lord just knows us so well. He knows exactly what we need. And so as um, I've moved in like my calling, she constantly encourages me. She constantly sends me messages like, it's so amazing to watch you do what God has called you to. And just these, these encouraging things, right? It's just so beautiful that God would provide someone like that and to be connected to it. But what I also, in this very space, I would also like to say like, in instances where we've dealt with like trauma in the past, it goes back to what we talked about, like that orphanage, that orphan spirit. If we um, don't deal with that, it'll be hard for us to accept our Barnaby. Oh, wow. And, and wow. missing, and so if we can't accept our bonus because we're just like stranger danger what do you want uh, 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 i'm good um then the connection because the connection between paul and barnabas was that he helped almost like they literally went hand in hand and i can't even really imagine what paul's ministry would look like without his encourager without barnabas right so if we don't deal with necessarily that trauma and this is just like the the, the christian counselor in me right um, if we don't deal with that trauma, we can miss our Barnabas and yeah. delay ourselves moving into our purpose. And so have you ever found like where you rejected it? Like where you were just like not ready for it? Like you just, nah, I'm going to do me, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's powerful when I think back over my life how many times, you know, God, God has a funny way of, <laughs> of checking me, sis. And I'm laughing because, and I'm, I mean, not even joking, like literally the way he checks me is because there's some, there's some demons out here that straight up just want to kill you. 
and and God lets me encounter them, and it's weird, okay? But in the midst of it, he always brings someone who is so encouraging in my path. And I, I, it's almost like uh, I was telling a young man at work earlier, he's, he's getting his, his role on, and not necessarily specific people, but um, random people. And it's kind of like God's trying to prime your pump again. You know what I'm saying? And he just brought this back to my remembrance is you start running into people who you'll have that short conversation with that they're Barnabases, but God hasn't assigned them to your life. And so sometimes we're so in the zone of that orphan spirit or I'm out here by myself, you know, like stranger danger, like you were saying to where you don't, you, you know, but you ignore when you hear God's voice and it takes someone like Taman who came to me and said, Br brother, and I like, you know, like brother, what's going on? You know, who, who are, who are, who are you, you know, uh, and, and where have you been? I know that God's called you. I believe we got sister Marquita's coming back on. I am waiting for her guys. Give her just a moment. She must be. There we go. Nah, that's okay. But it's like sometimes God would send those specific people. And I remember this is a Barnabas to me, even though he felt like I was a Barnabas to him. I was working at Walmart, Marquis, to answer your question more directly. And I really was um, living a life where I was really mentoring or trying to mentor. And the call of my life, I, I was trying to prematurely live out before what God had called me into. And it should have been a submission season for me because I was I had the gift of leadership on my life but I didn't have the counsel to go in that direction I didn't have the guidance to show me what that looks like to be balanced on both sides you know and so I mean I literally would just pour out pour out pour out pour out pour out and uh, I had this guy his name is James and uh <laughs> old black dude man he was so cool that was my guy man and I come into work he'd be like what's up daddy you, you been ready for work? And I'm like, man, I'm good, bro. He was one of the assistant managers. And I would come in, and because he knew me, Mark Kitty, he said, no. Nah. I said, hey, uh, James, where do you need me today, man? I, I, they called me their floater. And I would push carts. I mean, just anything. Stock dairy. I'd hit the palace. Like, whatever they needed. I mean, and they got done. We got it done. And uh, he said, no, nah, Danny, when I'm here and you're working, all I want you to do is walk around the store, check the end cap. What he was doing was cultivating me and yeah. in that season I don't know if he knows this but there was a lot going on in my family during that time and uh that peace and that solace with going to school family issues everything going on that was such a relief to come to work when I'm like man I got these six hours to put in that I can get right back up and go to work uh and work all day and pick people up so he was a Barnabas in my life and God kind of helped him for more of a sustaining thing I guess is what I would say to you Marquita to kind of give you like that break or that rest. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I know the question was more like, have you ever rejected a Barnabas? Man, I've straight up, I mean, straight up rejected many people when I turned away and and, yeah. and I fell away and just completely, I wouldn't say tuck, tell to run. I get bold with it. And mm -hmm. I go 100% for Jesus. But when I go the opposite direction, oh, bro, yeah. you want to know it. It's I'm going like, bottles, knives. There's yeah. no in between with Josh. Yeah. It's either black or it's white. And that's I tell it. People that, yeah, I'm the exact same way. Like either I'm on one end or the other. That's why when I dove in for Jesus, I was like, I had to ditch everything because it was just like, I'm all in over here. And it's dangerous for me because I know I'm charismatic. So yeah. why be packed in the crowd? And it is a problem. Yeah. It is a problem. Like yeah. I know it. <laughs> You know what, it made me think, because whenever the idea of rejecting our Barnabas, I thought about like when, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like my in my mindset, it was like everybody leaves. So it was just like, wow. it pushed me to, to just accept it. Like, okay, literally watching the clock, like when you're gonna leave. But what ended up happening, because I grew, also because I grew up with boys, um, whenever females would try to be my friends, I'm just like, mm, I'm good. You know, and so I remember even now, like just watching over the last, even since COVID, how God has cultivated 
those relationships. And I have like my sisters, like we, we call each other sis like all day, every day. But when I look at how we've gap, you know, connected even over the last two, three years, mainly because we have to accept the fact that it's just I, I appreciate y'all like I love y'all and be able to um to connect and be able to genuinely say I love you you good today hey like I called one yesterday and I'm like I just wanted to hear your voice you know like you're good and so it's beautiful because we don't realize because of our trauma that we need those connections. We build up these walls and these different things where we're just like, no, nah, I'm good. I don't need anybody, you know, this, that, or whatever. It's like, no, there is power. I say this all the time. There is power in community. And again, knowing that the enemy, you know, the Bible tells us to protect that unity. He's fighting to ensure that we don't make those connections. And so as we look at Paul and, and Barnabas and how even Barnabas served Paul, we think a lot of, I know that we're in a culture where it's just like, well, if this doesn't serve me, I don't want it. But knowing that he served him, but it was like a give and take, you know, iron sharpens iron. There, That was a ministry that they served in together. So yeah. while he did serve, um, it wasn't that it was just this, it, there was reciprocity. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And so being able to 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 um, understand I, that. I can't, uh, sorry for interrupt, but sis. I, I want you to know, like, I just felt led to say, like, I think sometimes people are scared to, to live. If you're a Barnabas is what I'm trying to say, be a Barnabas. That's it. Like, let's watch. There, there's an anointing in the Barnabas. Like you said yeah. something earlier that was so powerful about how he grabbed Paul's hand. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it's like, what if you chose not to grab someone's hand because you were too busy trying to be a Paul when God called you to be a Barnabas? You know what I'm saying? Like, don't yeah. try to be a Paul if, if, and if, because, because what you really are doing is you're more concerned with what people think of you at that point mm -hmm. instead of what God's called you to do. And I think about like Ananias, Barnabas, like Ananias was only mentioned that I know of one time in Acts that I can remember. Yeah. Right. But he's yes. the same one that God sent in that same scripture it says, go to this man. I'll show him how much he must suffer. And yeah. then when he went to him, one thing I pointed out, was that he said brother when he walked in the room paul's like or saul's like i ain't you i am not your brother yeah, <laughs> right yeah. like i will measure pain like i'm like bro that, i mean what was going through his mouth like, i ain't never heard this voice in my life and yeah. i'm blind who yeah. are you who are but you? god had already sent vision in his mind so i just would say just don't be afraid to be that barnabas if you're out there you know and, and because there's power in that pastors need barnabases yeah. they are barnabases but they're also called to teach and preach. But then there's some straight up anointed people who operate in the gift of encouragement. If we could just get activated in that area and yeah. be okay with playing the background, you know, yeah. and pushing anointing, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's like, and I'm okay with that. I don't need yeah. the microphone. I really yeah, don't. For sure. Cool. That is so good. It made me think about like as a hairstylist, like of course everybody, um, you know, like uh, uh, like desires to be like this platform artist, to be known all over the world, you know. And I remember God took me through this season, like, oh, okay, this is what you want. Let me give it to you real quick. And so yeah. I remember traveling and do, going all these places, and I was just depleted, exhausted. And I remember just coming to a place, and he's he, we always have these conversations when he's like, you done. <laughs> you do it your way. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I'm yes, because I'm tired. And he's like, okay, so now do it my way. <laughs> like, you can have it, God. But I always tell people, he gave me what I asked for, only for me to be like, you know what? This ain't it. This yeah. is not it. So it's like, Lord, I yield to you. I bow to you. You know, I think a lot of times we accept him as savior, but we don't um, necessarily reside under him as Lord. And so that that in its whole self is a training where we have to learn to submit, especially in our culture, in our society, submission, submitting to a, a higher authority, um, even to our husbands or, to, you know, to our spouse. It's difficult. It's not something that's well accepted, right? Or even taught. 
And so it was like, okay, God, now I bow to you as Lord. And so he put me on this journey. Like you said, it was almost like putting me into this incubator where he's like, okay, all I need for you to do is serve. I don't want you doing nothing else. Don't take not one more assignment. And here it is. People drop in in my email, like, come come here. We'll take care of the, the hotel. We'll take care of the flight. We'll make sure you have, you know, per diem. And we'll, you know, we'll pay you this <laughs> amount of dollars. And I'm just like, I can't. I'm good. Because wow. I was in the incubator where the Lord is like, this is where I am calling you to. And he's like, I'm calling you to serve and to encourage. Yes. And so when you said, if you're a Barnabas, just be a Barnabas. I'm going to tell you, life became so much greater when I accepted my title as a Barnabas to just wow. encourage the people. When people sit in my chair and I minister to them and, and just be what God has called me to be. That is also a part of that connection, being able to shift into the proper position. Just imagine if Saul was or Saul, Saul was still persecuting the Christians and Barnabas came about. That's out of alignment. He yeah. wouldn't have been able to do what he was called to do. That wouldn't, that connection wouldn't have worked, you know. So it's all also about being aligned and being submitted. Yes. Where that we're so submitted, where we're like, God, no matter what this plan may look like, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go. The, the when they say a yes spirit, give him that yes. yes. Like, I don't care. I'm willing to crucify my flesh to the point that I lay down my own desires so that I can fulfill yours. And that is amazing. And that's what we see in Paul, where he's like completely transformed, completely converted. And he's like, God, I will suffer for you. To the point of oh, near death. I mean, yeah. how many stonings did he? Almost every city, the the, the uh, chapter ended with By him stake. escaping a stone. <laughs> yes. Like, what's up? Like, that you, man can take the snake off his hand and keep grabbing sticks. People looking like, bro, he's cursed. Yeah. <laughs> what? You sure he's a man of God? Like, this is not <laughs> it. But he was so submitted. Do you? Uh, now, and this is something that I've, I've encountered in recent months, as I minister to other people, we are so um, dead set on being comfortable uh, that we are relinquishing our promise. And I always think about like the children of Israel, when they were coming out, they, they were about to give up their promise and go back to captivity because they're like, well, that's familiar. That's even though it, it shouldn't have been comfortable, it was what they knew. So in a sense, it was comfortable to them. And they were willing to relinquish Canaan. They were willing to let go of their promise. But it's like, we have to be able to suffer for him. And the scripture tells us that we will suffer. In this life, there will be many troubles. And so being able to submit wholly as Paul did, where he's like, yeah, this actually takes me to my next point where he was stoned and they cast him out of the city. They throw him out of the city. Because you imagine they throw him out the city and left him for dead. And it's like, I imagine when his when his disciples, you know, the scripture, a matter of fact, let me go to the scripture. This is 19 through 20. Um, Acts 14. I'm sorry, I can't say this. Acts 14, 19 through 20. And so it says, some Jews came from Antioch. Now, mind you, this is a time where they've served, they've, they've gone and they've been, um, they've gone from city to city already. <laughs> like we mentioned, escape stonings and all these different things. Um, and so now they are in Antioch preaching. And so, um, mind you, the reason they missed or um, they were escaping stonings is because people didn't necessarily agree with the teaching that they were given. And so it says here in 19, some Jews came from Antioch and uh, Iconium, and when they won over, and when they won over the crowd, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. After the disciples gathered around him. He got up and went into the town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. I can only imagine, for one, could you imagine the person who you have followed, who served as a mentor, maybe a pastor uh, in a pastoral leadership, um, you know, teacher, apostle, 
this very person that you become a disciple to is now being stoned and left for dead, right? Could you imagine the grief that they had when they stood around him while they're watching him lay here almost on the brink of death? But also, I just imagine that because they had been with him through all of this time, they've also witnessed the miracles and all of the things that he's done. Yes. And so while they may have been grieved at the sight, that their spirit may have been stirred to a point where they're like, we're believing that he'll be all right. I thought it was so like amazing that it says, and when they had gathered around him, he got up. Yes. And it was just like, okay, well, that was abrupt. But I said all that to say, when we're connected to the right people, they intercede for, I can only imagine that they may have been grieved, but at the same time, believing God that the same miracles that they had witnessed, they're going to see them again. And so if we could be so connected to someone or someone's, you know, individuals who, when we are at our lowest, whether that is spiritually, physically, where we're just like on this brink of giving up, where we're just like, we're, we're done, where they believe for us. Yeah. And it's just like, that's another reason why a connection is so important. Um, again, we know that we said this countless times throughout the cast that the enemy doesn't want that to happen. But when you can't believe for yourself or when you're just like Paul on the brink of death, someone who could stand in the gap for you and be able to intercede on your behalf to say, um, and again, we're filling in the gaps because that's that that scripture, it just says they got around him and he got up. I can only imagine, you know, that they were, they 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 had to have been grieved, but at the same time thinking, well, if we if 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 God has done it before, surely he could do it again, you know? And so have you ever had someone who when you were just down, when you were just, you know, at that moment where they interceded on your behalf, where they stepped in that gap and was like, oh no, you're gonna be okay. You you're gonna live. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, I, I had my heart absolutely crushed one time. And when I say crushed, you know, so like I told you, I don't have black and white in me. I just yeah. don't. I just ain't got black and white in me. So when I love, I love hard. Yeah. And that's the only way I know how to love. And so my heart as a young man was, I, I was crushed. And um, I came back. And the crazy thing is, there was an elder of a church, the same church that I had been invited to by tomorrow. Uh, the elder of that church invited me into his family's home. And when I tell you at that point in time in my life, it, it, it hurt. Like you ever had that gut hurt where like you you feel your heart beat in your, and in your gut. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of hurt. And that's kind of how I felt during that season of my life. And uh, it was crazy because there were so many thoughts that went through my head at that time, Marquita. I mean, just felt so depressed. I mean, put it this way, you know, when people, when they say, when, when uh, people are getting ready to get out, like, I mean, thoughts of like suicide and stuff like that. I mean, it crossed my mind and I'm not even lying to you. Yeah. I mean, I gave away, I mean, when I tell you I used to have some J's, man, I had like, I had a lot of shoes and a lot of clothes at that time because I was working good, mm -hmm. but then I pretty much just kind of like gave it away and have my heart broke during that season. I just started giving my stuff away. And you know, as a counselor, when people start giving a lot of their stuff away, it's almost like you're given an inheritance early because you plan on leaving early. Yeah. But it's more of a subconscious thing that was happening in my mind. And I didn't realize that I was, that's just the human nature to set up for when they're leaving. And so it's like, I felt like I didn't have much to live for. And that dude did not give up on me. That dude made sure I made it to church. That dude made sure I had what I needed. That dude made sure that I was fed. And I'm sitting there thinking like, God, now, you know, I'm not in any position or in any mindset to be encouraged right now, the fact that you would send someone to come and tell me, even though your mind's not on you, that you got me and you're providing the necessary care that I need when I'm just trying to check out, bro. Like to me, that didn't make no sense, Marquita. And it almost reminds me of the time when, when Peter had given up on ministry and he had denied Jesus three times, even though it was prophesied to him, and Jesus had already told him the enemy's desire to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you, mm -hmm. right, that your faith fell you not. And so sometimes we need 
Christ to come and visit us through the hands of those around us. And I love how Jesus made it his personal agenda to come back in John chapter 21. And that's kind of how I felt with this elder. Like he just, he came back to me and said, bro, I know I see what you just went through, but I also see the call of God on your life. And I choose to agree with that versus what I see you going through right now. And you mentioned earlier something that was so, so powerful. Um, so many people that are Barnabases, and I, I don't mean to take it on top, but so many people are Barnabases and they pour so much out. They pour so much out. They're like, oh, hey, no way that dude has a bad day. And so I've learned to be transparent because as a Barnabas, there's one thing you have to know is to, <laughs> if you have the gifting of Barnabas, the one thing you need to know is that you need a Barnabas. I say that all the time. You see what I'm saying? A yeah. Barnabas needs a Barnabas. Yeah. And so even though I was an encourager and leading men's group and all this, when I hit my rock bottom in that season, God sent me a Barnabas, a praying Barnabas. And it was just like when Jesus met Peter and he jumped off the boat, even though he probably had to be heartbroken, swam all the way to the shore. And here come the rest of these dudes riding in a boat. Like, why'd you jump out, right? And so I felt like I was sitting around this fire and almost felt like Jesus was asking me through this dude's hands, do you love me? Yeah. Cause you know, I love you. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and, and, and it, that consistency through that encouragement, just intercession, prayer, fasting. And I knew he was doing it on my behalf. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew it sis, but like, I didn't really, how do I put it? You appreciate it because it feels comfortable, but I was comfortably constricted in my feelings. Ooh, yes. I was comfortably constricted. I wanted the encouragement, but I wanted to embrace what I was feeling. I wasn't ready yeah. to let go, like you were talking about. So, yeah, that that dude may, I mean, I still have his number, still talk to him off and on. And the Lord made, made sure that I, I knew he actually showed up on, in Florida as a, as a concrete truck driver on one of my father's jobs mm -hmm. before. And then my dad called me on his phone and said, do you know someone named Lamont? And I was like, yeah. I said, you mean Lamont Plummer? He said, yeah. Man, he said, hey, boy. I said, what's up, Lamont? Like, my man was like, I was like, bro, I was like, never a dull moment with that dude. Love him. So, yes, that's that was my moment right there, sis. Yeah. And that's so good because I say all the time, even intercessors need an intercessors. Even encouragers need encouragers. I think um, I can only speak for myself as an encourager, as an intercessor, like, Sometimes you feel like a Lone Ranger because you're the one that everybody comes to for what for that that feel, you know, to almost like the gas station. Like everyone comes, they pull up to you to get their fill up and then they're on their way. And so you become accustomed to it. But you need someone too who can encourage you just the same. I remember when you were speaking, it took me to a time again, another dark season where I became suicidal. I don't even I life was good. Life was good, but it was just an attack of the enemy where yeah. it was like, just, just a play on my mind. And I never forget, we lived um, on the outskirts of, of um, Houston. So we had, I had to cross over this bridge, um, two bridges um, coming and going. So four times a day, I had to cross over this bridge and the enemy would talk to me and say, jump off. You might as well just drive your car off. And so I would find myself putting the pedal to the metal to get across this bridge as I'm fighting these thoughts to drive off. And no one knew this. No one knew this. Like, I'm just constantly encouraging. I'm just, and then I get in my car and I'm like, oh Lord, just let me make it home because these thoughts, you know. But again, you end up with this person, you know, my friend who calls and, and my husband is like, you good? I remember when my mother passed, I remember my husband coming up to me because again, I wasn't one as an encourager, not showing emotions because I'm the one who is encouraging. So I'm making sure everybody else is squared away. And are you encouraged? I need to make sure that you're lifted and all these different <laughs> things while I'm like in this sunken, like they call that sunken space, you know, this sunken place. But I remember him coming out one day and he just looked me in the eye and he said, I'm scared for you. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, where are you? Where are you? Like he couldn't even fit. We live together. Yeah. He couldn't figure out where I was in my headspace because I was constantly pouring out to other people and looking out for everybody else and not looking out for myself. So it takes having people and being connected um, to people, whether 
they know about you uh, uh, enough about you to say, no, nah, sis, you're not good. You're not okay. But you're going to be okay because we're yeah. going to walk this thing out together. And that's the beautiful thing that was displayed between Paul and, and Barnabas, even though there was a split at the end throughout that, that time. And we, the, I know we're low on time. That split in itself speaks to how at some point there's seasons. They, yes. Some people can come in simply to serve you for that time or to do what God needs them to do for that moment. And I've shared that before where God told me that in my job as a hairstylist, my door would be my, it would be like a revolving door. People would come in, receive the word of God, receive the seeds that they need, get their hair done in the process. Is that just being the avenue to get them in, but also be able to get what they need. And then they would rotate out and not to take it personal because the season had passed, the journey had been fulfilled the mission had been fulfilled. And so being able to even accept that. So I know that we that's also another connection for closure, but that's another topic for another day. Just, I, I was just gonna say, if I can encourage anybody <laughs> on this broadcast, yeah. the two things that I would say that encouragers should be is very discerning. You should pray for the spirit of discernment and discernment for what? Discernment for others, yes, but more so discernment for yourself because if you can't discern where you are, there's no way that you are going to be in a healthy place. Uh, because if you can't discern like and know yourself, like, wait a minute, that looks familiar. That's a, that's That discernment will help you gauge what season of warfare you're in. Is this a season that I do this or do that, right? And like you talked about it. And then the next thing is an encourager doesn't always have to come in the room. <laughs> you know, it, the Bible talks about crying with those that cry, laughing with those who laugh. Experiencing life with people means experiencing life with people. And your presence means more than the smile on your face sometimes. Because I can't walk up into a funeral and be all smiley, really, really, ha ha, right? When I go in there, I have to learn how to cry with these people who are crying, but then also bring that hope right behind us. Say, hey, let's shed some tears together. But let's also not forget that Jesus has a hope that goes beyond this life. You know what I'm saying? So, as a Barnabas, you definitely want to pray for uh, a season of discernment uh, for yourself. And the second thing is a, is a discernment of, God, is it time to laugh? Is it time to cry with this person? Is it time for a word of knowledge? Is it a time to just be there with them? You know, so that's the two things I say. If I had to say two things to leave you with, that would probably be for closure, making sure that you're able to do that for someone. Amen. And I would just say being able to seek the Lord concerned yes. um the most beautiful thing about god is that his love is unfailing it's unchanging and so it's something that he freely gives to us and so just being able to be in a space to receive it we'll be able to see just how concerned he is for every string of hair on our head and that is just so amazing because he loves us so much so well so intentionally that he's so he's he's in he's uh concerned for every every strand on our head. And so understanding that these connections isn't just so, um, just in the natural, but also in the spirit realm where that we, we are connected to God in a sense where that we can discern. Um, the closer we are to God, the easier it is for us to discern um, and operate in that discernment. And so if, if anybody, if you take anything away from this today, knowing that God comes first, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and God will pour out everything else that is needed in, yes. in his timing and <laughs> the way that he needs it to go. He will definitely do that for you. And even being able to receive that truth. Uh, we talked about rejection earlier, but being able to receive that truth that he loves you and he is intentional towards you so one of my prayers always is, Lord, allow my thoughts to align with yours and allow me to see myself the way that you see me. And if we can get to a place where we do receive uh, his thoughts or, or be able to um, think, the, think about us the way that he thinks about us and to see ourselves the way that he sees us, then when he makes these, permit, these provisions for these divine connections, um, then we can accept them graciously. And then also... Uh, steward them well, which is a whole nother topic, but we could steward them well. Yeah. And so um, 
Yeah. That was fun. <laughs> no, I mean, like, legit, like, time gets away from you when you're talking, you, you know, yeah. like. Uh-oh, did we leave him? Lose him? Uh-oh, I think we lost him, y'all. But we pray that you all, hopefully he catches this right before we jump in, but uh, we uh, check out. But we pray that you were blessed by something that was said on today. Are there any questions before we get off? We have about five more minutes. If there are any questions, please feel free to um, add them in the chat. Um, and we'll look for those. But if there are any, any questions, we pray that you were blessed by something on today, that something resonated with you and that you comprehend the importance of connection, connection um, here on earth, but also heavenly connection, connection to God in a sense so that we will understand how to govern what it is that he has blessed us with as far as the connections and friendship. That's what this was about today, being able to honor those connections the way that God would have us to. Um, I don't see any questions. So I take it that we are all right. Um, thank you all for tuning in. At this time, if anybody, if you feel that um, you have not given your life to Christ and you would um, like to take the opportunity to do that, we definitely extend Christ to you today. Um, in doing so, just believe in your heart um, that Jesus is the son of man and that God sent him to die for your sins. And that's it. It's not complicated. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot, but you can welcome him into your heart on today very easily. Um, and just, again, just believing in your heart and, and um, confessing that Jesus is the son of man. And that's, that's all it takes. Um, if anyone, let's see. If someone is not a consumer in Christ, what is your advice to connect with them? Well, I will always say, love them with the love of Christ, um, but respect their boundaries. Um, if you, I wouldn't push it upon them, but con be consistent in showing them love. Does it mean, I hope that makes sense. Continue to be kind to them, continue, but don't push them because of, of course there could be a uh, trauma. Um, and so they may not be willing to accept it just yet. And so if there is trauma, then you pushing could, could you know, push that deeper in. But what I would also say is pray for them. Um, we talk about praying for our friends and everybody else, even if you don't know a person, if you discern that there is some type of resistance to a loving thing, to an encouraging thing, to a good thing that you know comes from the Lord, then a, a lot of times there's some type of resistance, there's some type of trauma, there's some type of something that has caused them to create a wall to not be able to, to embrace that love and that encouragement. So I would also encourage you to pray for them that their hearts be softened I love that prayer. I always say, Lord, soften the hearts of your people so that they can receive what it is that you have for them. Just pray for them and intercede for them and just um, pray that they come into the true knowledge of God so that they also can receive love. Because a lot of times we can't receive love from other people because we don't rightly love ourselves. And so also add that to your prayer, Lord, that they will be able to love themselves as you love them and be able to see themselves the way that you see them so that they can receive the love and also issue love to other people. I hope that, I hope that answered your prayer. <laughs> I mean, your, your question. All right, y'all. Well, we thank you all for tuning in. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, and so we will pray this out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for walking with us on tonight. We thank you um, that the hearts were open and they received what it is that you have for them on tonight. We just ask that you um, walk with them, God. Uh, to, um, touch their hearts, Father God, and allow them to be heightened in their discernment, to be able to discern uh, when to push and when to pull back, to discern when it's a divine connection and when it is not, Father God, but also to discern when they also have their own boundaries and their own restrictions and their own resistance 
um, set in place from childhood trauma. Right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that everyone be healed according to the measure that you um, provide unto them, God, that they no longer push away the things and the provisions that you have provided for them, oh God, but that they will receive them um, lovingly and knowing that they came from above, God. We thank you on today because you love us so righteously, Father God. You love us so well, oh God. And so we just thank you. We love you and we honor you as we go about our day um, on or the rest of the week, Father God. We ask that you walk with us. Um, light a, uh, let your word be a light unto our footsteps, Father God. Um, and just let our the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable unto you. Until next time, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. We thank you again for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you again on next weekend, uh, on next Wednesday. Tune in. Thank you. Bye-bye.